loved it. So listen, we've been talking about fighting for a month now. And what I've hoped to do is at some point over this month, I hope that you've been able to identify something in you that is valuable, something of value. You know, maybe it's a, a relationship. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a, a good friend. Maybe it's somebody that's not here that you would love for them to be here. But there's something that I hope that has just come up that has been valuable for you. You know, overcoming an addiction or maybe building a better habit, treating people a bit nicer, whatever it has been for you, whatever that valuable thing has been for you, we're fighting for that. And what that means is that we're not sitting passively hoping that it gets better. We're not passively hoping that our lost friends or family come to church. We're not passively hoping that we beat that addiction or we break that habit. We're not passively hoping that we can treat our spouse or our friends better. We're not going to passively hope that when we go to work we have a better attitude and our boss doesn't uh, bother us the way that they would normally bother you. We're not being passive this year. That's why this is the year that we fight for it. This idea of fighting for it is us saying, we're not going to wait for this to happen. We are going to fight for it. We're going to fight for our marriage. We're going to fight for that bad habit to be broken. We're going we're to fight this morning. And this month, I know that we felt it. I know that other people felt it. Even this morning, we had our, our ban and cancellations happen this morning. And, and our ban, man, they, they have fought for you guys. They have fought for this. They fought to give you an amazing worship this morning. I told them this morning, you guys are anointed. Who cares who's here? Who cares how uh, ready you are or not ready you are? I just want to say to them, who's hopefully listening right now, and to you guys, that, that they walk with an anointing, and it doesn't matter because they are anointed to lead you guys in worship. But we, as a church, are fighting for you. As a church, we're fighting for the things that are valuable to you. Fighting for the things that, that matter to you. We're fighting for you in prayer. We're fighting for you in fasting. We're fighting for you in every way that we can imagine. But here's the thing about the fight, okay? This is, this is, so, this is so important that we get this and we understand this. So we, we're just now starting to focus on the fight, all right? It's been a month. I mean, some of you have been fighting a long time. But we, we've been a month into this. But guess what? We are not the only ones that are fighting for ground. It's not just us. See, there's a, a, an entity, a greater power that is also fighting for you. There's this greater power that's out there that, that wants to fight for everything that you're fighting for, but in the other direction. See, Satan has been fighting since the dawn of time. When Adam and Eve were created in the garden, Satan fought to ruin that perfect creation that God made. And he fought to ruin it because he brought deceit into that. He, he messed with Adam and Eve. He brought sin into it. And then there was a man named Job. And Job was walking with God. And they had a relationship of love. One that a God should have with a man and a man should have with God. And Satan wanted to ruin that. And he fought to ruin that. He even fought to change God's mind. To say, God, Job only loves you because you give him everything that he could possibly want. And he said, let me test him. Satan fought to destroy Job, but he didn't win that battle. Satan fought to destroy David. David was an anointed king, the king that Jesus' lineage would come from. And David, who was victorious in battle after battle after battle. Not only did Saul try and kill him so many times... And he survived through that. David hid in caves. But there was a day when David should have been at battle. He should have been off with his men, but he wasn't. He found himself on a rooftop. And Satan said, this is the moment. And he sent Bathsheba up there. And Bathsheba was bathing. And in that moment, sin entered into David's life. Lust entered into David's life. Satan never stopped fighting for David. When Israel was freed from Egypt, Moses came and with the power of God, with the help of God, Moses freed Israel. And something that should have taken them 40 days to walk into the promised land took them 40 years. 
And what was happening is Satan was fighting for them. Satan wanted to fight, and he wanted them to know that it was better to be enslaved uh, to Egypt than it is to be free under God. Isn't that crazy? You see how aggressive Satan fights for us? When Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan came after him, and he tempted him. And guess what he tempted him with? He tempted him with Scripture. Satan fought Jesus for 40 days through that temptation. When Jesus was born as a baby, he was born into a world that was underneath a king. And this king was a jealous king. And when he found out that a savior was born, he decreed that every child under the age of two would be put to death. Satan fought for Jesus as a child. Satan fought for Peter because he knew that if he could get Peter to doubt himself and if he could keep doubt and guilt on Peter then Peter would not be able to walk into what God was calling him to do, what Jesus would anoint him to do, which is to start the church that a lot of our churches are founded on. And poor Judas, man, Judas. Satan fought for Judas. And Judas is known to us as the one that put Jesus on the cross. He betrayed Jesus. But on the other side of that, Judas, he was created by God. He was loved by Christ, even though he knew he would betray him. And as he was loved and created by God, Satan fought for Judas. And through pride and through, uh, through the love of money and through greed, unfortunately, Satan won that battle and he took Judas. See, Satan is also fighting for you. Satan's fighting for your family. Man, is he fighting for your family. Satan... I'm going to try not to be a mess this morning. (laughs) I heard Judas Smith say one time um, that he tries not to be just a messy pastor crying in front of his congregation. But, you know, that's, I was like, amen, brother, I get that. But what I'm talking about matters. Satan's fighting for your kids, you know. The age that a child is exposed to Pornography is so young. The age that children are sexually active is so young. The age that children are introduced to uh, pressures on social media is so young. And parents, if you haven't started fighting for your kids and you're already on the back foot, you gotta, you got to fight. Amen. Satan wants your heart. He's fighting for that. Because if he can keep your heart then he can keep a foothold. He can keep bitterness in your life. He's fighting for your mind. Because if he can keep your mind, if he can influence your mind through your thoughts, then he's got ground there. Satan is fighting for your soul, most importantly. He's fighting with your soul through complacency. And as we are complacent, we don't feel like we need to do anything about our sin. We don't feel like we need to do anything about... Our lives, because we feel like we're okay. See, what you need to understand this morning is Satan is a fighter, and he hates you. He, this word here, hates. He doesn't want you to love him. He doesn't love you. He doesn't love your family. He doesn't love your life. He doesn't love your kids. He despises you. You are only valuable to Satan. Because God loves you. And because God wants your soul. That's it. That's the only reason that you're valuable to Satan. He hates you. He wants you to not connect with God. He doesn't want you to connect with anything. He doesn't want you to grow. He doesn't want you to become anything special. He wants you to be complacent. But what we need to understand more than anything is that Satan is continuing every single day, every minute of your life to fight for you. Guess what? Guess what? And this is why I'm so emotional this morning. I'm going to try and pull it together because I do have things that I want to tell you this morning. But no matter how much Satan fights for me and for you, I am an overcomer. And so are you. And the reason that I'm an overcomer You know, I'll tell you a story. Even in preparing for this message, every single time that I thought to say overcomer, 
Guess what word came out of my mouth? Imposter. Because Satan has been fighting to keep you from hearing that. And so I know that I'm an overcomer based on this fact. Because Jesus died on the cross. Because of Jesus, there was a total, permanent, final, irreversible defeat over Satan. And some of you guys need to understand this truth. Some of you need to uh, uh, accept this. You need to say this. You need to take a picture of this right now. I won't be offended if you pull your phone out and take a picture of it. Because what I want you to understand is that you are an overcomer. Because, because of Jesus, there is a total, there is a permanent, there is a final, there is an irreversible defeat of Satan. And he hates to be defeated. He absolutely hates this because as he's fighting for you and as he's fighting for me and as he's fighting for this church and as he's fighting against pastors all over the country, as he's fighting for your marriage, as he's going after all that stuff, he knows this. He knows it. But his hope is that you don't know this. His hope is that you don't believe this for your life. His hope is is that this is never something that enters your mind or enters into your thoughts. But it has been on my mind, it has been in my thoughts, it has been on my heart all month long. This is the message that I've been looking forward to the most to tell you about. Because we have victory over Satan. We have victory over what we're fighting for. We do. We have an amazing victory over it. No matter what Satan throws at us, we're not imposters, we're overcomers. And this is best displayed to us through, through a verse, through Scripture. And, and it's in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. I'm going to read it for you. Just please forgive me while I wipe my uh, face. Good thing I don't wear makeup. You ladies that wear makeup and, and cry, you know. I'm going to have to sit here and think about Kyle's horrible pickup lines to try and get myself out of, out of this here, you know. Uh, no, he's a good one to follow there. But, all right, Colossians 2.13 outlines, it, it declares that we are overcomers. It declares the victory that is over Satan. So I'm going to read this to you. In verse 13, all you, he says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that means that's us pre-Christ. We are sinners. That's what this means here. But guess what? He is made alive together with him. That means us that are sinners, we are now alive and together with Jesus, having forgiven all of your trespasses. That all we're going to come back to in the future, and it's going to be extremely, extremely important because it's also going to set us free. And then in verse 14, he goes on, he says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He's talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about the Pharisees' laws, the 451 or 57 laws that the Pharisees added onto the Ten Commandments that were written against us that always give Satan the ability to say, Aha, here's a sin in your life. He's wiped that out. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. See, when we stand under the cross, we're not bound by this. When we stand under the cross, we're sin-free, we're forgiven, we're covered. And in verse 15, probably my favorite part of this scripture right here, it says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Now, Before I unpack this verse here, I feel like I need to explain to you guys something that's going on in the service here. So for those of you that have been around for a long time, you guys have seen me ugly cry. Uh, For those of you that are new here, I just want you to know that I am emotionally stable, okay? I, 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 I promise that. I promise that. There's a couple things that work against me in these moments right here. The, the, number one, it, you guys don't know how much I care about you. I mean, you just, you, you don't. Like, you don't know that. Uh, the other thing that's just constantly working against me here is that there's this thing that happens when the Holy Spirit moves. And if you don't know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God's helper. When Jesus went into heaven, they said, Jesus, we need you here. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you something better. And it's going to be your helper. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit moves and it does things. 
And sometimes when it does things, people react in uh, maybe weird ways. Some people are lucky. They get like the warm fuzzies, you know, things like that. I just get utterly wrecked, you know. I just get wrecked and I just cry. And so I'm, I'm trying to hold it together. But you need to know right now that the Holy Spirit is moving and it's here. And the Helper is taking those things that you've been fighting for and he's taking it before the throne of God. I don't know the scripture offhand, but that's what the Holy Spirit does. When you don't know what to pray for, it goes to God for you. And so that's what's happening here in this room right now. That's why your pastor's a bit of a a, a mess this morning. So now that you know that, you can just forgive me as I stumble through. But I want to talk with you about verse 15 first. And then we're going to work backwards through these three verses. He talks about having disarmed the principalities and powers. See... When it comes to fighting, when it comes to fighting Satan, we don't fight in the flesh. This isn't a a fight where I can pick up something and I can go to battle and I can defeat Satan or I can defeat something in the flesh. This is not something that I can win based on uh, based on a diet or based on uh, anything else. This is not. It's not a fleshly battle. If there's a person that is uh, offending you. It's not the person, the flesh of the person that you're fighting against. It's, the, it's the, the offense that you're fighting against. See, the battle is in the flesh. And the reason that it's in the flesh is that when we die, when we pass away, the flesh goes away. And the thing that is constant, the thing that is eternal, that stays with us forever, is our soul. It's not even your heart. Your heart also, it stops beating and it goes away. The thing that never goes away, the thing that goes somewhere different when we pass away is our soul. So, of course, this battle is not going to be against your flesh. It's not going to be against your body. It's going to be against the principalities and the powers. And and, and this is is like, imagine this as being Satan's army. It's his army. It's all his demons. And, you know, I don't mean demons. It's like a a, a scary term. What I mean is that there, there is an absolute army against us. You know, you wonder uh, why sometimes you feel certain ways or why you feel down or why you feel discouraged or why you feel like you can't believe in yourself or why you feel like when you started fighting for something at the beginning of the month, all of a sudden it felt really hard and you just felt like you were punched in the face. Like, why? I, I made a mistake here. I picked a battle and I'm not actually ready for this fight. But because of this truth, principalities and powers, we learned through looking at uh, the story of Elisha and his servant. And he says, God, let my servant's eyes be opened. And I pray that for you guys. Oh, man, I pray it a lot. Because when his eyes were opened, he saw his side of the principalities and the powers. He saw God's side. And all around him were chariots of fire and horses and an angel army. And that angel army is fighting against those principalities and powers. That's why God gave us the armor of God. We can put on the the helmet of salvation. We can carry the sword of the Spirit. We can put on the breastplate of righteousness. We can wear the shoes of the gospel. Those are the things that we can put on when we fight against these principalities and these powers. And what's great about that is I don't have to be physically strong. I don't have to be physically fit. I don't have to be mentally strong or mentally fit. I don't have to have my heart in the right place. All I have to do is come to God and submit to Him and say, Open my eyes. Let me see what you're doing in the Spirit. Because you're winning this battle for me. See, when Satan fights against you, he doesn't want you to open your eyes and to see what God is doing. He doesn't want that at all. I mean, he dreads that tries to keep your eyes closed. I dare you to start praying, especially when things are hard and things are bad, when something's tough in your life, when you just can't seem to get a break. I dare you to start praying the prayer, God, open my eyes. Let me see what you're doing in the Spirit. And I bet you'll be encouraged because your situation may not change. Elisha's servant, the situation didn't change. The army still attacked. But there was victory there. And they were spared, but there was victory there. His eyes were open and he saw what was happening. We don't fight against the flesh. Because your flesh doesn't matter to Satan. Your heart, your soul matters to Satan. That's why this battle is there. But if you've given your life to Jesus, 
He can't touch your soul. That's why I can say that I'm an overcomer and I walk in victory because I've given my heart to Jesus. And so I'm, I'm untouchable. He may come after me. He may try and get me. He, th- 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 things may, may, may come. You know, last night I was here. I was here a little bit past 10 o'clock just praying for you guys. And I got here around like 7, and I was just praying and spending time working on this message, but, pray, but mostly just praying for you guys. And all of a sudden, like, load shedding happened, and the power went out. And this, you know, it's crazy. This little bit of fear came up in me. Like, oh, you're in the dark, and you're fighting against Satan. What if Satan comes after me right now in the dark in a church? And then I thought, <laughs> he, there's nothing he can do because my soul belongs to God. And I walked confidently in here, and I walked confidently to the car, and I drove confidently home. See, it's, it's amazing how hard and how much Satan is fighting for you because he doesn't want you to live in victory. He wants to own you, to own your thoughts, your heart, your soul, your kids, your relationships. He wants to own and destroy you. He hates you. Now, this word in the second part of this verse, this is, this is so great. Okay, this word triumphing is so wonderful because he disarmed the, principi- the principalities and powers of Satan. He disarmed it when he died on the cross. And then he made a public spectacle of them. It wasn't a, a hidden spectacle. It was a public spectacle triumphing over him. Do you know what triumphing means? This is so cool. In, uh, in Roman culture, a general would go to battle. And when that general would win the battle, he would return back to Rome. And when he walked into Rome, the Senate would gather, and they would take a vote, and they would vote him a triumph. Not a triumphing person, but a triumph. And then as a triumph, he would sit on a a chariot that would be led by a white horse. And behind him would be all the generals and, and all the, uh, the officers of the army or of the, uh, or of the other side, the other team that he conquered. And they would be chained. And they would be walked behind him through the city. And then behind them would be all the, the captives, all the people that he captured. And those people would be chained and they would be led behind him as he walked through the city. It even talks about exotic animals. Animals that Rome didn't have or they'd never seen, they would even be chained and they would walk behind that white horse in that chariot in that uh, triumph who was a, a, a Roman soldier or general would be there. And see what Paul tells us in this verse right here when he says that he is triumphing over here, this isn't talking about a victory that's in process of being won. This is talking about a victory that is won. He's talking about Jesus as the triumph, sitting on the chariot, guided by the white horse. And guess what's in chains behind him? Guess what's in chains behind him? It's this. It's the principalities and powers of Satan. All Satan and his generals. I want you to imagine a picture in your mind of them all behind Jesus, in chains and bound. We talk about it in here, binding Satan. You know, you know how easy it is to bind Satan? We just... Whisper the name of Jesus. Because that's how easy the victory is over Satan through Jesus. That's what the fight is. Sometimes all you may have strength to do is whisper the name of Jesus. But you can do that because Jesus is the triumph. He has been voted a triumph. And behind him lies everything that is Satan is chained, and he is marching not only through town, not not through Rome, but he is marching right through your lives. He is walking through your lives, displaying to you that he is the triumph. The victory has already been won. If you're praying that you can be victorious, what I want you to start praying is that you can understand the victory that's already been handed to you. All we have to do is step into it. And that's a process. I'm not saying that you should walk out here today and say, okay, I have a victory, and if I don't have a victory, then there's something wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. We get punched in the nose, punched in the gut. We have things that happen in our lives, and Satan, he never stops fighting for you, even though he knows that he's lost. He's never going to stop throwing things at your way. But I want you to pray that prayer. I want you to say the name of Jesus over those moments. And I want you to declare 
the victory has already been won. See, Jesus displayed this victory for us in two ways. There are two, two things that Jesus did as we back up through these verses in Colossians. And the first thing that Jesus did, and this is so important, is Jesus dealt with the problem of guilt. See, guilt is one of the strongest uh, weapons that can come against us. It's one of the strongest things that we have to try and overcome is guilt. Because he knows that if you feel guilty for something, even just the littlest thing, then he's got a foothold in your life. Do you know why you shouldn't feel guilty? Do you know why God got rid of all guilt? Because in verse 13 it says, When Jesus died on the cross, when he gave his life for us, he forgave that word, three letters, all. All. You know, you can feel guilty for eating that extra piece of pizza. You can feel, you know, guilty for maybe the sin that you commit. But when you bring that sin to God, it is all forgiven. I'm not telling you you should never feel guilty. What I'm telling you is that you should always take your guilt to God, to Jesus, because the problem of guilt has been dealt with and it has been taken care of. And it is no longer something that can bind you, no longer something that can sit on your shoulders. There is no sin that you've committed in the past. There's no sin that you can commit in the future that can change the truth that you are victorious through Christ. Nothing can change this verse in Colossians that says that you have been forgiven all of your sins. That means that I can walk confidently in my weakness. That means that I can walk confidently in my, my flesh and in my sin. It doesn't make my sin okay. But it means I can confidently every single day, I can go to God. I can go in the morning. I can go at night. I can go in the car. I can go while I'm using the bathroom. And I can go to God and I can say, forgive me, God. And guess what? My guilt should be gone. Because the problem of guilt is already dealt with. And so I want you to repeat another phrase all week this week. You are not guilty. You are not guilty. You know, being guilty also is something that a court passes down on you that judges you. And that is something, holy cow, Satan would love to do. Pass judgment on you. And you feel like he does it. You feel like that people do judge you. You, feel, you judge yourself. You know what's happening when you judge yourself? If, you're, if you ha have given your life to Christ, what's happening when you judge yourself and you judge yourself into guilt then you're taking the throne. You're taking that seat on the throne and you're passing judgment on you. But if you've given your life to Jesus, God's already judged. You know, I like to imagine Jesus sitting there on the throne saying, what are you doing? This is already done. Why are you retrying yourself? Because the trial is already over. The problem with guilt is done. Now, the second thing that Jesus does, and it talks about this in verse 14, and this is, this is important, but I want to make sure that it doesn't get confused or, or misconstrued here. Is, is this Jesus abolished the law of Moses. And what this means by abolish is, is he, 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 it's not that he necessarily gets rid of it, but, but he, he substitutes it. See, he's not talking about, I'm abolishing the law of Moses as a, as a historical text, or I'm abolishing the law of Moses uh, as, as good advice, or I'm abolishing the laws of, of Moses because it guides us in a good way. Like He's not taking away anything from the law of Moses. But the thing about the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the thing about what the Pharisees added to all of that is that if it still stands, if it is still our one and only means to enter into righteousness with God. And if it remains that, then there will always be something that Satan can point to and say, look at you. You still have sin in your heart. You still have sin in your life. And you will never be righteous. You will never be in right standing with God. Because that law still stands. It's a law that was created in a certain time for a certain reason, but it led up to Christ coming. And when Christ came and he died on the cross, he abolished all of that. And in fact, what he did is he took it and he nailed it to the cross. And when he nailed it to the cross, he solidified this truth in us. And it's this, that Jesus, he abolishes it. And he abolished it, uh, Jesus abolished it as just simply a requirement for achieving righteousness with God. 
This is the only reason why, what he means by when he abolished it. It is no longer a requirement for achieving righteousness with God. There's no longer a foothold where Satan can come in and say, well, you did this or you did that or you didn't meet this commandment, you didn't meet this law, and so therefore you will never be righteous for God. You will never be good enough for God. And you know what? In a lot of ways, well, in every single way, that's the truth. We are never going to be good enough for God. In my flesh, in my sin, as I am born and created on this earth, as I walk, I am not good enough for God. No matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, I will never be good enough for God, except that I have asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And when I did that, all my sin was taken away. And all things that would keep me from entering into right standing with God were taken away. And instead, I just get to stand under the cross. And when you walk and you stand under the cross and you see nailed on it this, this, the, the, the law of Moses which Satan would use as all the reasons why you can't come into God's presence, when you stand under that, then there is nothing that can keep you from achieving righteousness with God. Because you're forgiven. See, th- th- this is the battle. Th- this is a victory that some of you need to claim. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven all. I am not guilty. There is nothing that separates me from the righteousness of God. See, righteousness means it's right standing. And it depends solely on your faith. It's all about faith. When Jesus, uh, or when Peter was in the Last Supper with Jesus... You know, Jesus told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, ha, ha, absolutely not. You're the Lord and Savior. Jesus said, no, 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 you are. Peter ended up doing it. But you know what Jesus spoke over Peter? He said, Peter, I'm praying for you. Not that he would not deny Jesus. But he prayed for him that his faith would remain that his faith would stand strong. See that word faith, it's powerful. It means something. And through our faith, solely on our faith, our righteousness, our right standing comes with God. Do you know what that looks like practically? It looks like you come to a moment in your life where you say, I am no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to this world and to Satan and what he wants to throw my way. I am putting myself under the salvation of God. I'm accepting Christ into my heart. I'm giving him my life. And I'm putting my faith in the fact that he died on a cross for me. And I'm putting my faith in the fact that that means that all my sins are forgiven. I'm putting my faith in the fact that I have to carry no more guilt about anything. I'm putting my faith in the fact that nothing can come between me and the righteousness of God. Not a single thing. And that comes through faith and faith alone. See, we are justified through this faith. The term justified, it's a term that's used in court. And and it means declared not guilty. It is a declaration that is declared over a person. This is not something that we live in or we walk in. No, this means that if you've given your life to Christ, you have stood. Christ has stood for you in the court of judgment. And he had your name on a little name tag there. And he was representing you just like lawyers may go to court and say, Yes, I'm representing uh, Chris Ladd. I'm here as his attorney, here as his lawyer. And all the sin that I've ever done and that I ever will do is presented in that court. And Christ, He stands in for that punishment. He wipes all my sin away. Forgives me of everything. How good does that feel? And I am declared justified. Just simply because I put my faith in Him. And so, I have a message for Satan this morning. And I hope that you can adopt this message. But I just want to say, for me, for my family, for this church, that Satan will never have victory over us. And I want to say for you, maybe you don't believe it, but I believe it for you. And Satan will never have victory over you, ever. And so as we've been talking about fighting... 
as, as this has been something that we've been going up against this month, do you not think that the Jesus who conquered Satan, do you not think that Jesus who conquered Satan and his resurrection can handle helping you with your fight? Don't you think that that's a piece of cake to Jesus? Don't you think that, that that is something that Jesus, just with the swipe of his hand, just erases all of your sin, erases all of your guilt, and he helps you walk in that victory, whatever it is that you're fighting for, whoever it is that you're fighting for, and I'm fighting for you. I believe that Jesus is strong enough to overcome this. I do. I believe that Jesus is strong enough to deal with it. I'm not going to worry about you. Because I believe that if Christ can defeat Satan once and for all, surely he's good enough. Surely he's strong enough. Surely he is king and Lord enough to overcome anything that we are dealing with. And to overcome anything that you're feeling and that you're struggling with. Because he is the risen Lord and Savior. Through his resurrection, we cannot be defeated. And if you've not accepted this, man, I hope you do. It's so easy. It is so easy. You don't have to do anything except put your faith in Him. I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to have faith to follow and faith to fight. I want you to have the faith to follow Christ. When it doesn't seem like it can maybe lead you in a good direction or in the right direction, when, when your faith just kind of feels like, oh man, I, I don't know if I can do this or I can overcome this. Patrick, if you can turn that pad down, please. I want you to have faith to follow Jesus. I want you to have faith to follow his truth. I want you to have faith to follow what we're talking about this morning. As, as maybe God has spoken to you today and God has put something on your heart, I want you to have this faith to follow and then not only do I want you to follow, I want you to have faith to fight. Patrick, kill that pad for me. Because I don't want there to be any distractions here in this room today or right now. I want you to have the faith to fight. Come on, guys. The victory is ours. It's done. We spent three weeks learning about fighting. We spent three weeks identifying valuable things in us. I want you to have the faith to follow Christ. I want you to have the faith to follow His truth. I want you to have the faith to fight. When you don't feel like you can win that victory, remember the victory is already done. Now I want to show you a verse in Revelations here. And, and, and this, this unpacks it. This shows us that the victory is already done. In Revelation 22, 3-5, this talks about the abolishment of Satan. This talks about the total defeat of Satan. And it says there will no longer exist anything that is cursed because of sin, illness, and death are gone. Wow. Imagine that world. Hey, you know what? One day that truth is going to come true. One day we will sit in heaven. We will sit with our heavenly Father. And there will be no more sin, no more sickness. There will be no more, uh, none of us will be poor and worried about putting food on the table. None of us will have problems with our bodies. There will be nothing wrong. We will walk in perfect form with Christ our Lord and Savior. This battle is already done. And the throne of God and the Lamb the Lamb, which is Christ, will be in it, and His bondservants will serve and worship Him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. You know what? That sounds a whole lot better than some of the problems that we face every day here. But you know what? This is coming. This is coming. This is a reality that Satan is going to have to deal with. He doesn't want you to know about it, but now you do. We've said it, and it's true. This goes on in the next verse, and it says, They will be privileged to see his face, the face of God. His name will be on their foreheads and there will no longer be night. They will have no need for lamplight or for sunlight because the Lord God will illuminate them. That means that we will be consumed by the loving glory of God. Man, that sounds good. Guess what's not in that picture? Satan. He's not there to fight anymore. He's not there to gain ground anymore. See, the victory is already done here because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign as kings forever and ever. See, there is no end to forever and ever. It is just forever and ever. 
How temporary is this life of ours? How temporary are our struggles and our pain? How temporary? It is so short when it comes to eternity. And all we have to do is put our faith in Christ. There's something that I've been telling myself all week as I've prepared for this. And I have just said it over and over and over and over and over. Probably a million times I've said this to myself over and over and over. I put it on my my phone screen, my computer screen. I put it on everything. And it's a simple truth here. The victory is already won. Guys, the victory is done. I mean, we're going to fight. We're going to continue to fight. Because there's people that don't understand that the victory is already won. We are going to do that. We're going to punch Satan in the face. We're going to fight for our city. We're going to fight for the lost. We are going to fight for each other. There shall be no brother or sister in this church that feels alone because we are here to fight for each other because we care for each other. Because there is an enormous amount of love that wells up out of us that comes from Christ. And it is a confidence that cannot be shaken. And when I say that this is the year that we fight for it, this is the year that we take ground. And we say, I will not be shaken. I will not be overcome. I will not be considered an imposter. I am the overcomer through the victory that I have in Christ. And that is a truth that we will stand on through eternity. You have won your victory. Now it's time to just walk in that. And you walk in it by having faith. So I'm going to pray for us right now as we, as we get ready to close out here. I'm going to pray a prayer of victory over you. I'm going to pray a prayer that, that Jesus drops it in your heart so hard and so heavy that just for the first time, maybe the first time in your life, you, you realize it just dawns on you that I'm not a slave. I'm not a slave to addiction. I'm not a victim of Satan fighting against me. I am victorious. Because Christ died for me and his resurrection ended it. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that as much as the Holy Spirit has been working on me, that the Holy Spirit would go out and it would work on every single person in the audience right now. And every person that's listening online, everybody that is within earshot. And you know what? Even beyond that, that there would just be a wave of acknowledgement an acknowledgement that you are Lord, the victory is won. Father, our fight. Our fight will never stop, but we also will never lose that fight. Father, we put our faith in you. And Lord, I pray right now over every heart, over every mind, over every soul, over every child, over every family, over every single person. I pray over every single person that we worship in the next 10 minutes, that we spend our time worshiping like the victory is won. I pray this and I seal it in the name of Jesus.